bullet shot review and thoughts. Excuse me. Sorry about that. The first section of this video does not have any spoilers. Now, I watched this as soon as I could get the Blu-ray from the library. I wanted to watch it in theaters, but they ended up not showing it at a theater near me, and the library actually got the Blu-ray pretty quickly, unusually quickly. I have not read any Valiant comics. You know, they sound cool. I love comics. Marvel's my favorite. Spider-Man, Wolverine, and that kind of thing. So, starting with a spoiler-free review. Basically, we follow Ray Garrison, a soldier who, let's say he, he goes through something very painful, and after, you know, as a result, he gets some, I mean, I think the movie does refer to them as augmentations. You know, he now has super speed, super strength, and he, uh, what's the word? And, and super healing. And that is pretty much all I can really reveal. He's not the only augmented, and there are some, yeah, there, there are several twists. If you haven't watched the trailer and you're thinking of watching the movie, don't watch any trailer. They all give the major twists away. Now, the writing is very average. The There are a lot of things that really only work if you kind of don't think about it too much, maybe squint your eyes and turn your head the right way, then, then you don't notice the gaping plot holes. I will say that they do a decent job of, like, I figure the, the superpowers and such, the augmentations, let's go with, are probably from the comics, but they do a pretty decent job of writing them in and using them well. The one thing is that a lot of it isn't used very much. Most of the time it is Ray with the super healing, which we've seen before. You know, it's it's a pretty decent effect, but we've seen super healing. You know, I, I don't know if they were thinking, ah, now that Hugh Jackman has retired from, you know, action movies, we're gonna fill that hole. You're you're rural. You're really not. You're you're super not going to. But I, they try. the The writers try to come up with some fun scenarios, and just they they did their best with what they had. And this is a concept that works really well. I I figure probably the comics. I can imagine they're great. And apparently they're extremely. They, they did I read that right? They're like the best-selling comic or something like that. And honestly, a video game would probably be amazing. But I really, a movie where like even the first movie is supposed to have really dramatic, impactful stuff happen. This concept is just not built for that kind of thing. And I honestly, I feel like maybe. They should have started it more in media res and then just like backfilled in some of all the, yes, yeah, so a, a lot of the background. I feel like if they backfilled it after, because as it is, you just you spend a lot of time just setting up the concept, then you then, yeah, I can't go further with that sentence without spoiling something, but let's, let's, without spoiling, I will say that once they've set up the concept, then they, they can't just let things remain like that. They have to, you know, it, that's not going to be interesting for the audience. It, yeah, as, as a movie, as just a one of the, you know, 
a movie that you can't be absolutely certain you'll get a sequel to. You know, maybe, I guess maybe if they had made it as a miniseries or something, possibly even TV series, but then they really have to be sure that there's an audience for it. But yeah, like a miniseries, you know, I don't know, five to ten episodes or something. Then I think maybe, although I don't know if people are going to keep watching after the first few, but a video game and a comic book, 100%, but just there's some things that you can't adapt to certain mediums. Now, the characters are very stock, you know, the... I don't hate Vin Diesel. I think that he does an incredible job as Groot. I'm not that familiar with... I, I know of the Fast and Furious franchise, but I've never sat down and watched one of those movies. I've just seen other people video review them. I'm told that this is fairly typical for him. You know, he... He speaks in a low gravelly voice while looking determined and it's all about the, the personal, you know. There's not that much here. I think you, you'd have to be an incredible actor to make much out of Ray, who's really not, he doesn't express that much. It's not even, like, even in the writing. It's not like he's trying to express a lot and just failing, because he's not. No, it's there's not that much there, and that, again, works really well for a comic book and a video game, but not so much a protagonist for a movie. You know, I, okay, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to not just make this a long list of reasons why this should not have been made into a movie. I hope, I know it's not very likely, but I do hope that they do make more of these because they clearly have some compelling ideas, even if most of those ideas are just, you know, oh, that's really cool, man, rather than, you know, like really deep thoughts. You know, not everything has to be about deep thoughts. I know this is going to sound super stereotypical, but yeah. Isa Gonzalez, is not, I, I'm sorry, I really hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm not very familiar with her. She's quite good. She's probably the, the best. Okay, Lamar well, Morris is probably the best, but she's up there as, as one of the, you know. And uh, at the end of the day, she's not given that much to do. It's just, I honestly, I think really the reason why she comes across as the best is she actually has emotions. She's not just, I was about to say she's not one note, but she actually is kind of one note. But she's not, like, with Ray, there's just not that much. Like, he's really determined, and that's basically it. And then you have the, you know, a lot of other characters are kind of just jerks. Excuse me. Including some that are jokes for absolutely no good reason. Just they're they're they it's just for the antagonism. That's that's really it. And they're we're supposed to not like them. And her we are supposed to like. She actually she has sympathy and empathy, and that's basically it. But you know, she does a good job of that. She is appealing. Lamorne Morris plays Wil Wilfred Wiggins, who is Wiggins? Sorry, Wiggins, who's basically a, a computer expert. You know, I, th I think he refers to it as a coder. And he's just, he's, he's got this wisecracking personality. And he's, he's just, he's a ton of fun. And that's pretty much, I mean, I liked, you know, Guy Pierce, but I think that's probably just more that I, I like him and everything I've seen him in, I, I don't think, if I came into this with no bias in favor of him, I'd probably say that he's just completely stuck. I mean, the writing of his character is completely stock. Now, let's see, the, the cinematography is pretty decent. The, the movie has 
a bit of stylization without becoming completely obnoxious. Like, it's not a Michael Bay movie, you know. It's not... Am I really going to make this reference? It's not swordfish, you know. It's not completely just unbearable, obnoxious style. But there definitely is an overuse of, of slow-mo. But, you know... Yeah, it's it's fine. It's not. I mean, if hypothetically, if there is something that would get it praise from anyone, the people who. This is going to sound really condescending. I don't mean it to be. If you really love movies that are very visually compelling there's a chance you'll you'll like this a lot and that's not an insult that's just you know some people I, th I think everybody has some you know blind spot where there's something they really care about more than they maybe should and clearly it was something you know the the filmmakers wanted to put effort into that and they did and you know largely it paid off it's just a problem that you know there are problems in other places the editing is a bit like there there are scenes where there are action scenes where you can barely tell what's what's going on and this despite an overuse of, of slow motion now this really is not up to par for you know adaptations of comic books like it's not it's not as bad as the DCEU at its worst. You know, it's not it's not Batman v Superman bad, but it's really not it doesn't have that much going for it and it doesn't it does itself no favors with a script that has really big plot holes and really stock characters and just yeah, like I I think they spent a lot of time writing the script, so it's frustrating that it feels like they didn't. It feels like they banged it out in a short amount of time, and that's why they didn't have time to develop anyone's character. Like, before you say, oh, but, you know, a lot of the characters don't have a lot of, you know, screen time and such, they, they have as little screen time as, you know, some characters in some MCU movies, and those MCU movies still have better, like, the, the, I don't personally care that much about the Warriors 3 in the Thor movies, but they also don't have that much screen time of that many lines and such. They still have a lot more personality than these guys. Now, the, yeah. It's just, you know, the, the action isn't as good as other... I'm going to try not to praise the MCU too much in this, because I spend a lot of other videos doing that. I mean, I think that is about it for comparing... You know, I've, I've seen a lot of people compare this to movies from like the 2000s, the early 2000s, including comic book movies, you know, the early to mid 2000s, and yeah, that's that's kind of true, you know, the, the comic book is from the 1990s, and comic book adaptations have grown a lot in the years since. This, this is a similar problem to the, that the Venom movie had. I suppose I should say the first Venom movie, since we do know we're getting at least one more. And it's going to have Carnage, and that I am looking forward to. They're just... The, it You have to do something to update the character. You know, like, hypothetically, if I knew nothing about Bloodshot, I went into this completely blind, I would probably still be able to tell that it had its roots in the 1990s. I'm not 
saying something that I'm, I'm not criticizing the 1990s. I grew up in the 1990s. I love a lot about the 1990s. But you can't just take something from the 1990s and do as straight an adaptation as they did here. Like, I watched the, the special features on the Blu-ray and they talk about how they man, they made sure to update it. But really, when, you know, the stuff they updated was that they made the science somewhat more believable that was pretty much it the the tropes and the writing is very 1990s and you just can't present that as something new today you 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 you'd have to make it as a sort of like of a pastiche kind of thing you know like the cornetto trilogy you know, when the, the when Shaun of the Dead came out, it's not that it was the first zombie movie ever made. I'm not sure it was even the first... No, it, yeah, it wasn't even the first zombie comedy ever made. And as far as I hear, at least some of the other zombie comedies are incredible. Some of the ones that came before Shaun of the Dead. But it feels like, you know, it's it knows that... It has to present it in an interesting way. And it's, yeah, it's a pastiche. You know, you can... It's, it's not just a comedy, but there are also zombies, and it's not just a zombie movie with jokes. It actually, yeah, parts of it really do feel like the, the it's, it's like trying to, trying to binge or really even mainline a bunch of zombie movies whilst cracking jokes with friends who watched zombie movies before, you know. And if they had done that with this, which at times it feels like they are trying to, there are a couple of really self-aware jokes, but by and large, they are presenting it fairly straightforward. And yeah, the others have already compared this to movies like Robocop, Universal Soldier, Dread, 90s action movies like the ones starring Staring. Starring Steven Seagal, Arnie, Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, and it also has some stuff from recent action movies. I really wish that I could say that you shouldn't just watch one of those. But I, I really, I mean, I get, I would take this over a Steven Seagal movie, but I'm not really big on Seagal. That's why. If you like Seagal, I'd recommend you just watch some, some, some Seagal instead of this. I mean, I watched this for free. I, you know, I mean, it's the library, so I pay through taxes. But, you know, whether or not I watched this didn't cost money. I, you know, I'm not, like, I'm not unhappy that I watched it, but it's not... If even for free, I wouldn't say that it's like, oh, you gotta watch it. Now, let's see. Now, the, the tone, it's, it's fairly dark and with some jokes, but, you know, there's a lot of... J... Ray, sorry. Ray getting shot and then healing. Which, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. They get away with that in... With, with a PG-13 rating, but, you know. Now, let's see. the So the best aspect, I would say the... The action scenes definitely have problems, but they are all distinct from each other, and um, in, a, in a number of ways distinct from most other, you know, like action movie scenes in general like there there are this movie had things that i haven't seen in other you know and yeah i i enjoyed the action and i yeah that's basically and yeah so let's see the the worst aspect 
you know, is probably the, the, well, let's see, I guess it's a bit of a toss up. One option is the fact that they have these really fun and memorable sci-fi action concepts and they don't really use them like the all the augmentations in this and you just you see so little use of it it's just yeah but that yeah so that's one option and another option is the I guess Yeah, I'm okay, I'm going to lay this out and possibly yeah, but yeah. As you might guess from the concept, given that our protagonist can heal injury extremely effectively, there is not a lot of tension for him potentially failing. And once again before you say what about, well, other movies where the antagonist is very difficult to take out. Like, you know, anything featuring Wolverine, anything featuring the Hulk. You've got, you know, the original Universal Soldier movie. They set up that the protagonist can be defeated, although it may take something specific or may take a lot to do so. And for a lot of this, that there isn't really, some, you know, something. I'm... I guess I shouldn't give away whether there eventually is something. Let, let I, I guess I'll, what I'll say is, it wasn't as big of a problem as I thought that it would become. Yeah, thought that it would be, but it it is something, again, like, the first half of this movie is maybe the first issue of the book and I don't think that's a problem as long as it's you know an inexpensive little comic book and then a month passes or something you know and then you get another one. It, it certainly it's nowhere near as long but you know the moment that it's a movie you have to account for that th you know these characters <laughs> like even in the MCU a while will actually pass between two characters like okay sometimes in the with the team up movies sometimes they'll have they'll appear in multiple movies in one year but otherwise yeah it's sometimes it's a year sometimes it's several years before we see this this character again at all you have to tell more than the origin story before you you finish that first movie or people are not going to come back and <laughs> I swear I'm trying not to praise the MCU too much, but the MCU has gotten incredibly good at this. You know, they a lot of their movies are origin stories, but they manage to include something so where it feels like a you know a full story, not just the first part of a story. And with this, they just they needed to fine tune it a bit more. Now, let's see. So, I like to try to, you know, bring up who, if any, of the people who helped make this movie are worth following the work of from now on or seeking out old work by. <laughs> Again, sorry to be obvious, but Isaac Gonzalez. I'm sorry, I'm the more. I'm sorry. The, the the actor who plays Wilfred Winnigan. Win yeah. Something like that. <laughs> that's that's pretty much what I Yeah, I'm I'm told that uh, Sam Hewen is great elsewhere. I'm sorry, he didn't really He's fine. He's perfectly fine for what he's asked to do. But I wouldn't, like, if I didn't know that he was good elsewhere, I wouldn't, you know, look him up after this. But, you know, I'm told that he's 
Let me think. Was it Outlander? Anyway. <clears throat> so. Who would I recommend this to? And who would I recommend not watch this? I think if you... If you're one of the types of fans of the comic book who really want to see these augmentations on screen, yeah, the the there are some really fun action scenes, and they fit in like a uh, you know, I again I haven't read the actual comics, but I could tell from reading that they fit in some stuff that will appeal to people who read the comics. And, yeah, you know, if you really love the, the like I said, the, the 90s action movies and such, and you want a, a more recent one, then this is one. Yeah. And honestly, I'm not sure. I think pretty much everybody else should just skip this one. I realize, you know, now that it's not in theaters anymore, you know, but if you're looking to, like, buy it on Blu-ray or something, or if you are considering streaming it and you have something else you'd like to do in that, you know, what was it, hour and 43 minutes, I think, before the end credits start, you can think of something better to do with your time. I pretty much guarantee you that. So, yeah, uh, rating, I... I give this five nanites healing injuries out of ten. For the rest of the video, there will be spoilers. So let's just note time. There we go. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary, you can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. And I try to talk faster in the disclaimer since a lot of it is standard information, so excuse me. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast once I get into the, the later sections. And yeah, so the rest of the video contains spoilers for the movie, and I might spoil some of the, the comics since, you know, the movie's based on the comics. And let's see. Yeah, I recorded this as soon as I can get to the computer after watching the movie. And I might swear in this video, probably roughly the same amount that the movie, that of swearing that there's in the movie. And yeah, you know, from here on out, this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of these analysis, some of these MSC riff, riff tracks and other jokes, etc., especially jokes in the first section. You know, thoughts that I have while watching in chronological order, as well as before watching, separating the first two sections. Time codes in the description box, and then a final section where I get into stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, IMDb, and Wikipedia. And I had read most, you know, actually, yeah, I had read all of it by the time of recording. Some of it I read right after watching the movie and before recording, since there were spoilers in it. And if you're not interested in the contents of all three sections, I invite you to only watch the ones you are interested in. I try not to review films that, you know, fall into genres I don't like. I'm going to be criticizing this, but... I This is a, the kind of thing that I could have loved. You know, if the movie was really well done, this is the kind of... I love Universal Soldier 1. I love Robocop 1. Yeah, there's a lot of Jean-Claude Van Damme that are guilty pleasures of mine, and and Arnie action movies, you know. But 
this just... I'm not saying that those movies have perfect writing, but I don't think there's really an excuse for writing this bad today. You know, like, you could have spent longer on it. You could have, you know, th there are things that are common knowledge today then you know yeah for someone writing it in the 80s or 90s pre-internet yeah they get stuff wrong they misunderstand stuff but today there's just no good reason for that yeah now let's see so yeah some action movies treat women badly making them disposable using misogynist tropes Sexualized against their will, only there for that purpose. Sexually assaulted, raped, not film exploring the effects of it. Ultimately, Ray's wife is, you know, the the. I think it was I think it was the average script that pointed out that basically Ray is fridge man. You know, his wife is there to get killed. I do appreciate that it turns out she wasn't killed, and she seems very happy with her life, you know, but she is basically there to motivate him, you know. We, we are not supposed to care about her happy life. The fact that she has a happy life is supposed to motivate him, yet again, you know. So, the, the, yeah. Let's see, the, the... That was, but KT, you know, it's, again, the abridged script points out, you know, the one major female character who's, yeah, she's the one who feels guilty about, you know, which, so that's the, that's still, the, you know, if they're going to write in a, a woman, they're going to make her the sensitive one, you know, the emotional one, but she did, yeah, Katie is legitimately, you know, I wanted her to be in more of the movie, and I might seek out other movies of hers. She's in, like, Hobbs and Shaw, I think? So, that would necessitate me watching the Fast and Furious movies, so... It's not impossible. Let's let's go with that. I guess the yeah. Anyway, she was legitimately like you know obviously the she is sexualized with once again it's not a problem that a female character is sexualized if that is the point. The scene where she's seducing Wilfred. I think I'm just going to call him W. W.D. No, wait. That doesn't work. Ah. Wigan. It is Wigan, isn't it? I think it's Wigan. Wilfred Wig... Wig... I'm sorry. Um, Wee oui, Wee. Oui. I'm going to go with that because I'm certain that both of his names start with W-I. When she's seducing Wee Wee, of course she's supposed to be sexual. You know, that's that's the point. She's, you know, same as like when Mystique seduces someone. She, you know, they are using their, you know, them, be, the, them being sexually attractive to lower someone else's guard to, to, yeah. But when she's, like, doing the swimming thing, which, you know, the abridged script points out, you know, one of her superpowers is that she can swim underwater while wearing makeup. So it's pretty funny. The, the... If you haven't read the abridged script, pause this video, read it. I don't want to spoil any more than I already have. Excuse me. Let's see. So the the yeah, when she's swimming, she's not trying to look attractive. You know, that could maybe be a you know, and again, I'm not saying that that's like it's that it is a big 
problem because ultimately, you know, Ray is the only one who sees her and she doesn't mind the, you know, there possibly being something there. Actually, come to think of it, I guess that does, that is something that Emil wants to happen, so it's him using, yeah, that is kind of gross. But, yeah, you know, she, she is strong, both physically and emotionally. Yeah, like, the, the couple of times where there was threat against her, I legitimately did care. Like, you know, there's this brief bit when, you know, after she blows smoke in Wee Wee's face, there's this brief bit during the fight where it looks like she's, you know, they're going to be able to take her, but she does win. And, you know, when Emil shuts off her, you know, the, the breathing thing. Now, let's see. Now, the movie could get very boring if we see the augmentations used too much. I think maybe by the end we've seen... I think they, sh they should have come up with a few more things. There's too much in the movie of just Ray getting shot and us seeing him heal. That really is... that. There should have been, like, hypothetically, for example, let's say that in one action scene, he's getting shot at, like he does in the movie, and we see the, the um, you know, the, the wounds heal back up. And then he maybe faces someone who attacks with swords, while he doesn't have guns, and that guy, like, maybe lops one of his arms off, and then either the arm reattaches, or a new arm starts to grow, or something, you know. But just, that would add a little bit of variety, and as it is, yeah, the movie's almost all him get, almost every single time he's in an action scene, he gets shot at, then he heals, and then he moves on. And there, there is too much of that. But the, if it had more variety, then it would only be too much of just the healing by the end of, yeah. Now, when I talk about the quality of what I'm doing a video on, I try to strike a good balance between being appreciative of both intentions and results, criticizing things I genuinely feel should be criticized, and I try to judge the subject on its own terms. I never for a second thought that this was going to be like, let's say, Tenet, for example. I didn't think that this was going to just change the way I looked at this, that, or the other thing. And I'm not, I'm not judging it based on some, uh, you know, yeah, some standard that isn't, I mean, I guess whether or not the standard I'm holding it to is reasonable is subjective. So what I'll say is I'm, I am trying to make sure that the standard I hold it to is reasonable. Now, so yeah, as as I said, I did not have to pay any money to to watch this. So anything negative in this video is not out of bitterness. I also do not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video, and it's not that I'm upset at how it compared. You know. Yeah, how it compares to what it's adapting, which I've heard about and read about. Two other movies like it. And I don't have some kind of personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things that I say in this are fair criticisms based on the budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. And... Yeah, it's, 
normally at this at this point in the disclaimers I mentioned when I first watched the movie and obviously you know since it's so recent it's not that I watched it years ago but I do think it is worth noting I have only watched this movie once but I did watch it very very you know I, I watched it then I watched the couple of spoiler things read the abridged script which had spoilers and now I'm recording this video so there's not been a lot of time in order you know which could excuse me, lead to me forgetting. My opinion of this movie did not change due to the trailer giving away the major twist. I still went into this pretending that I didn't know that since based on the movie itself it's pretty clear you're not supposed to know the twist going in. And I mean I kind of, I would say that I would say that they had to I mean I think it's fair to say that it's probably the single most memorable aspect of what I know at least because once again what when this character was created Wolverine was already a thing so heels and stronger than I I think the I I'm pretty sure Bloodshot is stronger than Wolverine but you know I mean he's not stronger than Superman so Super strength, healing, you know, these are not things that, you know, and he's got, have, apparently he can, like, change his appearance to some extent, which we don't see in the movie, but apparently he can do that in the comics. That's also a thing other comic book characters that came before could do. You know, but, yeah, one of the most in interesting things about Bloodshot, this version at least, is that he is you know, the things that he thinks are his memories are a simulation. You know, that's interesting. But if you give that away in the trailer, that's a lot of, yeah. I think they should have focused on the fact that there are these augmented people and, I mean, the moment that you make it, look like it's a personal mission I mean that is technically not accurate but yeah I, I don't know exactly yeah honestly if I were to cut the trailer and no one was forcing me to do it another way I would probably try to focus on him going out for revenge honestly maybe what they should have done was him going out for revenge and then make it look as though when he does the other RST guys, the other augments are sent after him to stop him because technically that does happen, it just happens later in the movie and it's not because of the revenge so so yeah, I, th I think that's the you know, but don't give away that twist but yeah, anyway now, me making jokes in this video should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad. I simply find it very difficult not to MST for gain overanalyze everything I watch. But some of it is about it being bad. Now, let's see. I'm probably not going to criticize violence and gore in this, but I might discuss it. So. I don't want to put out there. I don't have a problem with violence and gore in general. I think it's one of my favorite horror movies. It works in general. I also love Cronenberg's The Flying Video Drum. I don't have a problem with disturbing and upsetting material in general. Monster is one of my favorite movies. Now, that brings us to. Notes taken while watching. Excuse me. And, right, right. I want to briefly say this has an adult rating here. Wait, sorry, adult. That makes it sound like the rating here is that you have to be 15 years old, but that's because we don't have 
you know, it's PG-13 in the U.S. We have age 15 and age 11, and, you know, they thought it was too much for an 11-year-old. I agree. But it is kind of funny that, uh, yeah. Anyway. Right, briefly, I haven't watched a lot of Vin Diesel. I remember him being good in Saving Private Ryan. I watched this because it's a comic book adaptation, not because Vin Diesel stars in it. Principal photography began on August 6, 2018, and it officially wrapped October 25th, 2018. So post-production took upwards of a year and a half. Like the original premiere here, pre-corona, was the 20th of February, I'm almost sure. So that's that seems like a long time. And I'm sorry for that. The effects could have been at least a little better, at least some of the time. It was, yeah. Anyway. Pretty good opening. It's tense from right away. And, you know, seeing Ray breach is legitimately pretty cool. I said, hold on, Breach. But he's so good at it, though. And now that I know that that whole thing was just a simulation, that put in his head that he goes against orders and gets results. See, when this movie gets, like, kind of meta and clever, it's pretty decent. That's a good... Because... I didn't even think, like, when I just watched it the first time, I didn't think that part was a simulation. I only thought that it was a simulation from when, I mean, I guess basically, yeah, yeah, the, the when, when his wife gets kidnapped and killed. No, actually, no, I thought that that happened, but that it didn't happen with any of the people that they made it seem did it, you know, but, but yeah. The movie, you know, the movie is setting up to the audience, and the simulation is setting up to Ray. He goes against orders, but he gets results. Did not expect him to put his gun down, but, you know, he tricks the guy into pointing at the phone and then shoots him now that he's not aiming his gun at the hostage. Just under five minutes into the movie, and, you know, Vin Diesel is in a tank top. And Ray gets back with his wife, and the way it's sh the way she's filmed, even if I hadn't seen the trailer and didn't know the concept, I would still know that she's dead meat. Which, again, I did not see the twist coming that she was still alive. You think someday maybe you could start emoting? Are you questioning what my body can and can't do? I mean, no one ever accused the film of being subtle. Please ignore the fact that I called it subtle just like two minutes ago. And Ray is in the bathroom and hears a noise. Baby? I mean, if the sex was unprotected, possibly, yeah. Very cool scene of him taking out the guys who came for him after he realizes they took Gina. Toby Kebbell dances and lip syncs to... I forget, is it just called Psycho Killer? I, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about it. it. It, you know, it's very goofy. I mean, it, yeah, it's it's there so that they can have, excuse me, the trigger of the song. And Ray being interrogated goes pretty much the way you expect. It's, you know, we've seen this kind of scene so many times. The only thing they could come up with to make it fresh was the dancing. Which goes double for, you know, once we realize it was actually just a simulation. Yeah, I, I thought that they used some kind of, you know, you know how in our dreams 
you know, we can encounter someone who looks like someone we know in real life. I thought they were doing something like that. They were like going in and manipulating his memories to make the guy who actually shoots him and his wife, you know, make them look like the people, the targets they wanted him to take out. Anyway. And... Yeah, and so when yeah, when when he wakes up, you know, KT tries to calm him down. Honestly, it comes off as her actually caring about him. Initials KT. I mean, they did have to address that since they sound the same if they wanted people to know, which it was. And Emil says that Ray's body was donated to them by the military, and KT looks away, which, if you don't know the concept, is a subtle hint that he's lying and she feels bad about it. Emil pushes the glasses back on his nose, and I think that's the first shot where we can tell that he's got a robotic hand. That's a nice, subtle reveal. Emil talks about how they build prosthetics and such. But you, my friend, are proof that we are making advancement in the most critical human technology, voice and graveling. And... Yeah, we're told about the healing and the nanites. The extreme close-up on the healing of the hand is legitimately very good CG. The mouse that just died. I see the subroutine we titled Captain Obvious is running at peak efficiency. And Emil introduces the other augmented people. And after Ray meets the other augments, he says that he's going to go back to sleep. Or maybe go wake up, which is a realistic reaction. Excuse me. And we see Ray starting to remember parts of the death of his wife and himself and he punches his fist right through the punching bag Ray looks at you know the, the column and once he's fairly sure that this is in fact a load bearing column he starts punching it and he starts lifting weights and we see yeah we sorry the audience and Ray see Katie swimming underwater showing off and Ray and Katie talk by the pool between this and New Mutants that's two comic book adaptations not likely to get a sequel with a delayed release that were released in 2020 in theaters that have a scene where one man and one woman talk by a pool both of them damaged you know like the and, and, yeah, both of them augmented. Like, yeah, I mean, other than the fact that in New Mutants they're teenagers, that's, yeah, a lot of similarities. And Ray starts remembering his death. And, yeah, that's when it dawned on me that the music thing was for the music cue, reliving the memory. And Katie tries to talk Ray out of going. But, you know, it, it, she went with the, yeah, I think she's going along with the manipulation rather than her actually trying to talk him out of going because she did, yeah, the way she looked at the, for, for getting him in there, yeah, I, th I think. 
I don't think the movie itself actually established that Ray can, you know, search the internet for information using his brain. It's in a deleted scene, so I knew about it, you know, but I wonder if people were confused about it watching the movie without, excuse me. And Emil tries to convince Ray to come back, but we realize later it's for show. Do you even know how to fly? I'll find a way. That's a yes or no question. I will say that this bit of Ray going off to kill Toby Kebbell does do a nice job of establishing just how efficient he is. You know, downloading the ability to fly, a plane which he steals, and all the stuff he does with guns. And so, you know, he is a one man army. I like that we don't see exactly what Ray is going to do from right away. We start by seeing it from the bad guy's point of view. Not saying it's original, you know, Batman Begins did it. And did it even better. But, yeah, you know, we, we see, you know, the power goes out. The truck crashes. The dust completely covers everything. And only then do we start seeing him attack. And I think it's like one or two minutes between those things happening and then him starting to attack directly with weapons and such. Excuse me. I must not have gotten enough sleep last night. But the um, I don't I don't think I've seen another action scene where it was like this. You know, it's not the only one I've seen where it's in a tunnel, but. With dust covering everything, you know, yeah. You know, the the first action scene, the, the breaching and going up and saving the hostage, I've seen scenes like that in other movies, but the movie also doesn't do a scene that's all that similar to just that, you know. And I'm pretty sure the viewer isn't supposed to believe that they actually killed Ray when they shoot him and he goes down. And he gets up, shoots. You know, the, the action scenes are pretty cool. And yeah, the, you know, the whole tunnel scene really shows a lot of what Ray can do. In part because, you know, the team he's up against get to do a number of attacks on him and he survives them and moves on you know they you know attack him with grenades they shoot him a lot and and these things yeah i mean this is this would be the tutorial basically if this were a video game i would really i would play the video game for this and ray draws a smiley face on the window and now he uses a grenade to make a hole in the window big enough that he can shoot Toby Kebbell. Excuse me. And from what Toby Kebbell says to Ray, we can clearly tell that, you know, Toby isn't who we thought he was. And Ray, sorry, KT says, I'm done too. So another hint, KT doesn't like what they're doing to Ray. Dalton actually walks away from an explosion. They actually played that straight. And Dalton pushes a button so Ray can't move, so... That's something, at least, as far as weaknesses go. But, you know, other, he is still invulnerable when fighting anyone other than his own team, other than the, the EMP, and that, yeah. And 
often talks about how they're manipulating him, knowing he won't remember, and that's basically just there for the audience. I mean, I get that Dalton gets a thrill out of it, but it's very short-lived. And Dalton says Gina isn't even dead. Dumbass catches on too late. There's a callback to that in the original ending where Ray kills Dalton after saying that. As it is in the movie, there's just no callback to that, but there didn't need to be. That's basically fine. Told you I'd tell you everything. Didn't expect that to be the payoff to that. And we see them manipulate the memories that Ray has. So, you know, that whole thing was fake. And that, again, just clearly there was, excuse me, some skill involved. Excuse me, here. They actually did think to, like, literally everything we see about Ray before... RST is manipulated and we like when we watch the movie before they say five years we think that he's only been there a short space of time but he's been doing this for five years and it's just it's only now that you know I mean basically the big thing that changed things was that Barris had hired Wee Wee and Wee Wee was able to shut down Ray and get him over to his side. You know, I yeah, I appreciate that. That's a that's a good like honestly by the end of the movie we don't know how much of what we even saw in the entire movie was real, you know. It's it's very Philip K Dick, very total recall. And yeah, about 45 minutes, so, you know, there's just under an hour left of the movie before the twist that the trailers gave away is revealed, before we see the manipulation, manipulating of his memories that get him to kill who they want him to kill. Excuse me. I do briefly want to say, you know, I, I was it maybe the abridged script that said that, you know, it's way too elaborate. They should have just, the whole memory thing, they should have just told him who he is and told him, if you don't do what we tell you, we've got a button to shut you off. I think there's some chance that he would just try to see if the, you know, if the other side could just kill him, if that was all they had. You know, but revenge is a powerful motivator. For the men in his family. See, I might even say that that movie, no, it's, it's still worse than this one. Had you go in there, didn't I? Be honest. For a second, you thought that I would say that this movie was actually worse. I'm not going to say, excuse me, what movie I'm referring to. Because that quote is, in fact, a spoiler for that movie. So... And if you don't, you know, know enough about that movie to realize that that's a reference, I envy you. Right, so the yeah, Katie and Emil talk about the manipulation. We find out why she doesn't just walk away. And it is of course one of those scenes in cinema where two characters talk about something that both of them already know. 
But at least we do find out that Emil has, you know, he's done horrible things to people who try to leave his employ. And, you know, we find out just how little Emil cares about Ray. You know, he's a soldier, a dead soldier. America makes new ones every day. But yeah, you know, we find out that he can shut down her breathing thing. And we do, in fact, see him do that in one scene. If she doesn't do what he says. You know, and keep, keep in mind what, you know, her doing what he says, at the end of the day, boils down to manipulating Ray, tricking him, lying to him. She's not going out there and taking on these squads of, you know, dangerous, yeah. And yeah, and I, just briefly, I saw the abridged script say, why doesn't Emil just make himself this, you know, incredible, you know, unkillable soldier? I think it's, I think there's a chance he's, the one thing he is honest with Ray about is that Ray did die, and this is the first time they were able to bring someone back from the dead. And A, he doesn't want to die for it. B, either he would have to agree for someone else to have a kill switch for him, or he would have to convince the you know other people to let him do it without a kill switch. And... I really don't think, and you know, C, I don't think he has military training himself. He wants someone who has military training already. Now, let's see. And yeah, Emil gets Ray ready for killing Barris. Is it just me or just Barris look almost exactly like the guy in the car? with Toby Kebbell and the movie admits that dancing to psycho killer is cliche which doesn't really ins absolve it from using a cliche not gonna lie I did not realize that that was a cliche though six inches is not a lot I've seen reviewers point out that it's a long time to wait for a payoff to that joke yeah, I, th I think everyone who brought it up thought that it was worth it, but, yeah. I really appreciate that they use a montage, excuse me, to communicate that Ray gets ready to kill Barris. Instead of us having to watch every bit of that again. Although, at first it looked like it was a montage showing that he'd kill lots of people. But then later we find out that no, it's Toby Kebbell was the most recent. You know, we only see him kill Toby Kebbell and Barris, but he killed all these other people before them. I really feel like that was too awkwardly established. It wasn't very... They didn't do a very good job of communicating that, clearly. It is a pretty significant... You know, how much time passes between killing Toby Kebbell and then going after Barris. You know, it's it's important for, among other things, we see how emotionally invested uh, KT is when it's just Toby Kebbell. So when she helps after Barris, it's kind of important if that's like the next few days or if it's like months after how, however many kills after is there a particular part of your body that needs augmentation this is a lot of you know penis sized jokes for one movie and a lot of them come in very short like that's two in a very short space of time and the, the abridged script points out just how, you know, 
like it jokes oh the audience just goes crazy about how funny that is because it's it's so just we've seen it before and Dalton is frustrated with Ray and let's see yeah and, and Emil just you know I mean basically berates him like it's almost like he's you know the parent and Dalton is like the the bratty brother of Ray who's upset that his brother is getting all the you know all the attention and you know it is likely that Emil has a shutdown button for Dalton like how they have one for Ray he's Trojan horsing it pretty clever actually okay okay you don't need to pat yourself on the back And Wee oui, Wee oui turns on some device and then explains, you know, there are things he needs him to do. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm actually kind of invested. I'm a little excited how this turns out now that there is a potential weakness, something that can stop Ray. And, you know, we find out the. Let's see. Yeah, you know, find out that it's an EMP. And instead of a countdown, it's a dramatic count up as it charges. And Ray shoots Barris, but then we, we activates the MP and it doesn't down shot. It does indeed shut down Ray and a lot of other stuff. You know, he said that there's only one use of it. He didn't say there was only one remote for it. And let's see. Right, and we we wakes Ray back up and talk. And I was honestly like the fact that Barris was also kind of a bad guy and just like kidnapped Wee Wee to force him to work for him and so Wee Wee let Barris die before stopping Ray that was a kind of it's, it's a decent little twist Now, let's see. You know, for, for, uh, just briefly, I, I thought, well, you know, why, if, you know, if there, there are certain targets that are so important to kill you know using Ray why did they go through all these other people first and then Wiggins says no, they're all defectors and Ray asks Wiggins to reverse engineer the nanites it's my army now and your job to keep it that way Very, very rote dialogue. Wiggins does a decent imitation of Ray thanking him. And he has to use a vintage car with no electronic parts as he goes searching for Gina. I honestly thought that Gina would think that Ray was dead. And Gina says she moved on and apparently has a kid, two kids at least. And I'm guessing that it is not Ray who is the father. And, you know, we find out that Ray has been at RSC for five years. Are you okay, Ray? Can I call someone? I really appreciate that they didn't make her a bitter ex a la Taken. It, you know, ultimately, whether she's, you know, 
yeah, let's just go with evil or, or good. You know, I mean, at that point, they just need her out of the movie. You know, even the bad guys don't even care about going after her. You know, I, I don't know. I guess they're just that certain that he didn't tell her anything that could get them in trouble. You know, she's always, you know, the, Gina is barely in the movie. And the only reason she's ever there is to motivate Ray. So once Ray knows that they're not together and that it's not going to get, you know, five years, they're not going to, she has kids and a dog, they're not getting back together. So at that point, they, you know, it's up to them. Are they going to make her, you know, a good person who tries to, who, who worries about him seeming so out of it? And, and not remembering all these important things, or is she going to be just this really, you know, awful person? And, yeah, they, I appreciate that they made her be a good person. There's, it would be really uncalled for. So, yeah. Pretty cool to see Ray finding other augmented. So he's finding someone who... You know, they don't have the same powers as him, but they do have powers. He has powers, they have powers. And I'm just going to put out there that the first X-Men movie got to that point much sooner, but okay. An hour and 13 minutes into the movie, so, you know, there's like half an hour left before, you know, and, and finally we have Augments fighting other Augments. And before you say, oh, you know, the the augment you're supposed to think the augments are on the same side as Ray. Well, how about one of the first action scenes? The bad guys have an augment because they managed to reprogram him. You know, they 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 knocked him out and reprogrammed him, and now they're you know, yeah, augment versus augment fight early in the movie, and then again late in the movie. You know. It didn't have to be so long with like there's there's so little with you know and they have such interesting you know the the guy who can see through cameras the guy who can run extremely fast and even briefly run on walls and the actually now that I think about it, what what exactly were that other guys the Let's see. Yeah, suddenly I can't remember. Ooh. Let's see. You've got the running guy. You got the got the guys. You know what? I honestly don't remember. And considering how little time it's been since I watched it, that is kind of sad. But. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I do not remember. It wasn't arms, was it? Because Emil already had the robot arm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, you know, they have... I don't remember what the ability was, but I remember liking it while watching the movie. So the guy is using a drone to see Ray. Very clever, very comic book. And it's not something I've seen in another comic book movie. And as far as I can remember, it's possible there has been one. I just forgot. But I feel like a, a comic book movie should be able to offer something that we haven't seen before it in another comic book movie. Because comic books, the sky's the limit. You know, there's almost nothing you can't do. Like, if you want to... I'm not going to spoil the movie here, but if you sit down and think about just how many different sci-fi concepts are all in the movie Avengers Endgame. I'm not saying all of them are prominent, but think about just how many there are. The sky is the limit. And yeah, this, yeah, you know, despite all the other superpowers I've seen, I can't think of one that where someone is like using, you know, looking through various cameras and yeah now let's see 
they actually have cops with coffee and donuts. I can't believe we're still doing the stereotype. And Ray and Dalton both get hit by a truck. And Ray gets up immediately, Dalton not so much. And Ray looking at the truck driver as he heals is very Terminator. And then, you know, the, the guy jabs Ray with the, the thing, the syringe thing that shuts him down. Ultimately, you know, okay, ultimately that wasn't a very long fight between Augment. I mean, most of the time it was just a chase. I, I really feel like they should have had more. Even with the climax, I wanted more of Augment's fighting other Augment's. But I will say that the, the climax went on for a decent amount of time. Excuse me. And KT does actually try to leave. And Emil turns off her breathing and it's in his arm so no one can take it away from him. He doesn't have to be careful to remember carrying her on switch. And Wiggins falls for the trap and helps KD with the light. And she blows the smoke back in his face and it turns out to be some kind of knockout gas. And as we know, she doesn't get affected by stuff like that. And very badass bit of her fighting the guards. See that? I, I really appreciate that. It's... It's not a big deal, but I don't think I've seen it in something else either. Now, if, if it was the only thing, then I'd be like, okay, we need more. But yeah, it's kind of cool that you know she she stands there and he blows, and, and he's like reacting and falls over, and she's like, it's bad for you. And you know, I mean, by that point, it's been a while since we were told, but it's pretty memorable. Like literally, she's immune to all inhalants. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a pretty, and I mean, I don't know how realistic that is, but certainly it would be a useful thing to, yeah. And Emil and Ray talk about how Emil has been manipulating Ray. People like boxes, Ray. Haven't you watched those game shows where they offer them the mystery box and they take it and it turns out to be crap? I do kind of appreciate that the movie starts in media res and only later reveals that that's what it did. By the time the movie starts, Ray has been working for them for five years. We just think that it only just happened. See, I think an argument could be made that they shouldn't have had the Toby Kebble bit. They should have had Barris be the first mission. We don't actually need to see the, the memory. Like, hypothetically, let's say that we only see him go through it once. And then when he wakes up, you know, the, the, he's, he's, told about how they've been manipulating him and maybe one of them yeah maybe they can like find um an image on yeah like maybe they they can put it up on a screen like so you think that's who killed your wife and, and ray's like yeah you're sure it's not this person or maybe this person and just you know and and he he sees these faces and he thinks back and suddenly he realizes, holy crap, I did see that guy. I did shoot that guy, you know. Yeah, you just, you know, get it, get it going much sooner because really it is once Dalton tells, you know, he, he says it to Ray, but the audience is the only one. We, we remember. He doesn't. Once he says... This is all just, you know, for the next maybe 10 minutes of movie, we're just waiting for something new to happen. Like, eventually, you know, we find out that Barris has an EMP, 
but leading up to that, we really didn't need, yeah. And Dalton tells KT that they're getting rid of Ray, and briefly she tries intimidating KT, and she just smiles, clearly not impressed, and he stops trying and just lets her pass. And KT goes in and claims that Wiggins got away, which we, the audience, know to be a lie. She's buying time to free Ray. And, yeah, you know, they have another target. So, you know, Katie is taking advantage of the trust that Emile has in her. And she somehow shows up in the simulation, which makes no sense, which the abridged script points out as well. And... Yeah, Katie presses some switch, and now Wiggins is in, getting back into his own code. So, they set up that Ray is impossible to hack, and then they explain how he's hacked by revealing that one of the programmers isn't working with them, so he can hack into it. It's, it's a very easy fix for a problem that they didn't have to make that hard. I kind of like the... the Joe, you know, I need real friends or a therapist. And Katie and Emil fight very briefly, and she, yeah, it's not, it's not very much of a fight. And Dalton plugs in the additional arms, and the other guy gets some knives. And Wigan tries to talk KD, KD, KT, sorry, through the erasing procedure, and she just gets out some grenades and uses them instead. So I guess the gas she used was extremely flammable, and that last thing she threw, you know, set fire to. Yeah, I think. And Wiggins is still talking, and he thinks that she's listening and doing what he's telling her to. And we, you know, we even hear him say, it's very important that you do this next part. It's, you know, exactly how I tell you to, so, yeah, it's pretty funny. It's good to know, literally no one is listening to me. Sorry, that's as close an approximation I can do right now with his accent. And Ray and Dalton fight. Excuse me. And Dalton's second set of arms are longer than regular arms, so we again have Ray at some disadvantage. I appreciate that. It's not in a lot of the movie, but they do occasionally have a disadvantage. I mean, you know, for the first. Let me see. Yeah, for the first little bit of it, Ray literally can't get close enough to Dalton to even hit him, and hitting his mechanical arms doesn't hurt him. The fight in the elevator shaft is pretty cool. And the elevator shaft comes to an end and the system is apparently overclocked. And because of all the dust on him and the, the red, uh, what's it called? The glowing red of the, cause, cause it's at a low, you know, there is the, it's almost depleted, you know. Now Ray does look exactly like this comic book comic book. I mean, the colors are a little muted, but that's par for the course by now. But his skin is actually pale white, and the, the yeah, the lights in his chest are glowing a strong red. And Emil uses a grenade launcher, so it seems pretty effective. So he was prepared for this sort of thing, since we know that he can't just shut Ray down anymore. He doesn't have the connection because of Wiggins. 
and Ray walks up to Emil. He's out of nanites, but he blows them both up. And they do the fake out protagonist death. I mean, I do appreciate that the ending does legitimately look like it might be a simulation. And, you know, but obviously Ray is not actually dead. And they actually say, oh, you have even more power now. And yeah. I appreciate that Ray actually did thank Wiggins twice now because Wiggins really did. You know, work hard for him. And. Yeah, and the movie ends with Katie and Ray briefly relating about, you know, things they did that they regret. But, you know, they can try to move on. I appreciate that today movies acknowledge that, you know, military people and such do still have emotional needs. And. Yeah, it ends on them driving into the sunset and Wiggins pointing out that it might be a simulation because it's, you know, how ridiculously perfect it is and such. So yeah, the movie is an hour and 43 minutes long without end credits and 49 and a half minutes long with them. So, let's see. That brings us to the next section. Notes taken before watching. So yeah, the, the director of this, this is the first movie he's directed, excuse me, but he did visual effects on Age of Ultron, which, you know, he, uh, he did on others as well, but that's one I watched, and yeah, he did great on that. And he apparently did, he, he directed the cinematic trailer or cinematic slash trailer, whatever, for Bioshock Infinite. I love that trailer. I mean, that's, yeah, that's such an excellent trailer. So, you know, I would have bought that game even if not for that trailer, but the trailer is some, one of the things that got me really excited for the game. But, yeah, so the, and and you can tell the, the visual effects, the, the visuals are strong. And let's see. And Vin Diesel produced this and some Fast and Furious and other stuff he stars in. And this was written by the writers of the Nightmare on Elm Street 2010 remake and the 2011 The Thing. So, I, you know, I sat down watching this hoping that the third time was the charm for stuff by them that I watch, but... Okay, it's better than those. It, you know... Anything's better than 2011 The Thing. And it's hard to find something worse than 2010 Nightmare on the Street. Which sucks, because I, you know, some of the people involved are extremely talented. But yeah, Vin Diesel, I've seen him in Saving Private Ryan, Triple X, and his MCU roles. And I have to admit, I had forgotten about this, but Aza Gonzalez, I also saw in Alita Battle Angel, but that's, you know, I, I think it was the, excuse me, the abridged script for that that pointed out that it has a number of very, you know, familiar actors in a distracting amount of CG, I think it was, you know, that you can't really recognize their faces. I think I have an idea of who it might be, but I can't, yeah. And Toby Keppel, you know, I saw him in Alexander, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, Wrath of the Titans, and Fantastic Four. Oh, this poor guy. I mean, maybe other people have seen movies that he's in that are good. But, 
yeah, maybe one day I'll be able to watch a movie that he's in that's actually good. I like him. I like him in all these movies. Now, let's see. That's, yeah, and, and Guy Pierce, who, yeah, I love him in all of these. Saw this very briefly. You know, I saw him in L.A. Sorry, La Confidential, Rules of Engagement, Memento. I remember that movie. The Time Machine. Wish I could build a time machine, travel back in time two hours, so I didn't have to waste time watching it. Hmm, some of these are spoilers, so I guess I'll do yeah. Prometheus, Lawless, and Iron Man 3. So yeah. I've seen others compare this to Universal Soldier. I'm not going to spoil Universal Soldier. It only happened so early on, it can't even be called a spoiler. I just want to point out that that movie, the first Universal Soldier, does actually get to the protagonist realizing he's being taken advantage of, trying to escape the program from very early in the movie. So it's disappointing that this movie takes so long before he realizes that they're taking advantage of him. It, it really... They could have, <laughs> yeah. Now, so the Blu-ray, for some reason, the, the menu doesn't come up. I think if I watched it on the TV Blu-ray player, then for that I get the menu working, but I watched it on the PC, so I didn't, you know, so for some of these, I don't know exactly what the, thing is called, I'm just gonna, because I, I had to pick it off this playlist that the Blu-ray player gets, yeah, excuse me, now, yeah, so there's 12 minutes and 9 seconds of deleted scenes, and, yeah, the, it actually, it has the thing where Ray tells the soldiers, you know, they're, they're back from the mission, and he tells them, yeah, yeah, he tells them he's proud of them, and to live in the moment. It has a few additional lines. It's not much longer than the movie. You know, about a minute after he appears, he takes off his jacket to reveal a white tank top. And they explain to Ray about the nanites. He turns out now has a lot of information. I think they said all information anyone knows you know, he has access to the internet, yeah, then, you know, except for the classified stuff, they say. That's why he doesn't remember his past. And then there's a bit where there's, like, a bunch of smoke. I, yeah, actually, I guess that's right after, you know, KT destroys the, the server room, and it's that smoke. And then the the... Dalton uses his, you know, he finds a dead guy and then he attacks Ray. I don't know, I th the dead guy, let me think, was it, I think it might have been one of the, one of the other two. I, I don't even remember what happened to the guy with the, the camera, was that him in the, I mean, there, there are three. There are three augmented guys other than Ray and Neil. And in the... Yeah, when they fight in the, in the elevator shaft, there's only one... Sorry, there's only two of them, so I don't remember what happened to the other one. But yeah. One of them is, is dead on the ground. Dalton finds him and attacks Ray. And, you know, it's deleted scenes. The CG is unfinished. And, yeah, he uses his arms to keep Vin from keep Ray from punching him, punches him a bunch. One of the punches to the jaw sends a lot of blood shooting out of his mouth, seen from behind. And then Dalton says, killing's easy. I don't need a motivational video for it either. Burn. And then Ray gets some of his nanites into the metal arms and uses it to destroy the metal arms. And, let's see, 
there's a thing here. What was it that? I mean, I think it's because there's blood, which is nanites, on the arms. So that digs into the... But I don't think anything in the deleted scenes or the movie sets up that he can use... Yeah, anyway. But yeah, he destroys the the arms, and then, like, the vest is too heavy or something, and the guy starts drowning in the pool they're in. And Ray says... There it is. Dumbass catches on too late. But, um, yeah, you know, drowning in, a, in water, that's, yeah, I mean, the, the guy, you know, Ray is an anti-hero, so, not saying it's okay, it's, depicting it is arguably okay, but obviously, Killing is never okay. Now, unless it's an absolute last resort. But, you know, here it is kind of... So he, he could just, like... Now that the, the metal... You know... Yeah, he could, he could, like, disable his augments and, you know, dump him in front of a police station or something. A la Batman or Spider-Man or something. And... Yeah, and around eight minutes in, then they start talking about the fight between Dalton and Ray, and then it plays again, even though it literally just played. And right after it's done playing, the people making the movie explain that the studio wanted something more bombastic, and so they came up with the elevator shaft fight, which is in the movie and the trailer. I can see how this would have been way too small of a death for, you know, he's one of the final bad guys, and it's the end of the movie, yeah, but... Yeah, the fact that it plays all these other, you know, it's like they group them in the this one playlist thing. I can imagine if you watch it, you know, if you click on the individual things in the in the menu, Blu-ray menu, then it wouldn't play awkwardly one after the other like that. And then there's one, excuse me, called Forgotten Soldiers, the cast of Bloodshot. It's 11 minutes to 30, 13 seconds. I only know that that's what it's called. Because it flashes that title at the start of the video. And yeah, someone refers to the movie as A Child of Total Recall, Terminator, and Memento, which is very true. And Vin Diesel likes that Guy Pierce's villain is not a mustache twirling villain. And Guy Pierce likes the tension in the relationship between Emil and KT. And she says that everyone on the team has sold their soul to the devil to survive. And we're watching how they all deal with their trauma in different ways. Wow, she actually, yeah, I just remember that she said that. She made it sound way more compelling. I mean, maybe it's that, maybe like to them, maybe they try to bring it into their performances, but in the final film, it is not there. Like for her and for Ray, sure, but not anybody else. And Vin Diesel and some others like that there's a vulnerable aspect to Ray Garrison, even though he's an alpha male. Which, they use that term unironically, which I didn't even know excuse me, anybody did, but, you know. Holly, I heard somewhere that Hollywood's like 10 years behind on trends or something, so there you go. And... I'm sorry, I forget his name. Let me just spend just a few seconds seeing if it's maybe written on the... Yeah, it does not look like it. Okay, so... Huh, Matthew Vaughn helped, I guess, produce... Yeah, executive produced this. Anyway, the... Let's see... L Lamorne Morris, I want to say, he deadpans that he thinks it's great that someone like Vin is willing to help him, you know, someone so old and bold, willing to help someone so young and handsome, just, yeah, he's, he's just as funny out of character as in character. Then there's something called Initiate Sequence, Directing Bloodshot, which is 9 minutes and 16 seconds, and the... Yeah, the visuals are based on the director's interests in science and video games. He says it's more science fact than science fiction. 
He wanted authenticity, and he, and and see again, like this is legitimately an interesting. I forget if it was him, but someone in this featurette points out that the movie is in part about the illusion of choice. Every day, technology makes the decisions for us: what to eat, who to date. Maybe the wrong choices would evolve us in different ways. In, in sorry, in interesting ways. I wish I got that from watching the movie because it's such an interesting. It's a really good point. And yeah, the the man, I wish that was in the movie, but I don't think there is that much like real depth in the final product of the movie. That's really too bad because clearly the people working on it are intelligent people with interesting ideas that they tried to put in the movie and. I don't want to say never hire a special effects guy to direct a movie. I'm just saying it doesn't very often work out that well. And Vin Diesel says that everyone can relate to being manipulated. And what does it say? Can you know, cannot believe the state of despair they keep him in. The film's technology needs to feel like it actually exists when viewers just don't have access to it, and they want it to make it unappealing. That's why the nanites are bugs. And yeah, and then there's the several more times the alternate ending and the part about where they discuss it. That's right, that's th four different times, is there? And then there's two parts that are just some, the, the, one of the deleted scenes from the grouping of deleted scenes, but it's the same, it's not, there's no difference between, anyway. And then online, I watched the two minute, 41 second gag reel. It's fine, but it's not that compelling. And not all of it is even a gag reel. The last chunk is advertisement for buying the Blu-ray. Then there's a video called The Ending Explained. I'm not going to lie. I saved that link long before watching it, like weeks ago, maybe months ago, I forget. When I watched the end of the movie, I was like, what's to explain? It's completely straightforward, but to be fair, they point out that the ending may be a simulation so that a sequel can work with that, you know, and that's that's a fair point, but it, yeah, it, it definitely didn't need to, I mean, the reason it's 7 minutes and 39 seconds is because it also talks about, like, background and all this stuff, and it's, it's yeah, anyway, and then I watched Angry Joe's 35 minute, 37 second video it's been a long time since I watched anything Angry Joe, and I, I wasn't that big of a fan of his, but, you know, the, the video was worth watching. I don't really have anything to add to it. You know, if you watch this movie and you want to hear someone talk about the stuff that was bad about it, I recommend it, his video, you know. And I watched the Everything Wrong With video on the movie, and, you know, 18 minutes and 13 seconds. Again, I don't watch very many of Simpsons' new videos, but this one was pretty good. There's, you know, there's a lot of dumb stuff in the movie to pick apart, and he does a good job. Some of the time, he does like go off on tangents or, you know, point out stuff on the screen and and such. But it's it's a pretty decent video for for one of his newer ones. And yeah, and I took some notes on the trailers, so let's see. I guess there's not that much. Yeah, you know, the, the trailer, yeah, so the trailer gives away the twist, and I just noted, you know, I really feel like they shouldn't be giving away in the trailer 
unless it's revealed in the first 15 minutes of the movie or something. It feels like it's a mid-movie twist, and we'll just be sitting there waiting for the movie itself to catch up with what we already know from the trailer. Bad marketing. And... Let's see... Yeah, you know, the... And then I noted the concept is, as presented in this trailer, looks really cool. The first row. I'm just not sure how they're going, how there is going to be tension in the action scene since the nanobots and bots and his blood make him basically indestructible. It's not a problem by itself that he's also really strong, but they will need some kind of weakness for him. Yeah. You know, the abridged script points out there are three times in a row where Ray gets shut down with something. You know, EMP. Uh, what's it called? The the nanite disabling syringe thing. What was the other one? Maybe the the uh, maybe the Dalton switch, I guess. And yeah, they they put out a second trailer, and I was like, this trailer is so similar to the first one. I'm not sure why they bothered making a second one. And, yeah, then I know that, you know, how is this PG-13? Isn't the trailer R-rated? The concept is that he gets shot and reformed since he's human. How can they do that without an R? And basically, they make it just... Excuse me. They, they have it... You know, they, they showed in, in a way that just barely squeaks by as a PG-13. And... Yeah, I noted here on the let's see, the 5th of March, I noted that I may be in the minority on this, but I quite enjoyed Guy Pearce in villain roles, even in movies that I don't overall like. And, yeah, I've already said, you know, but it bears repeating. I'm not entirely sure there's any movie where I didn't like him in the movie, even if I didn't like the movie itself. He's been in movies that I really don't like. So yeah, you know, I noted it sounds like a concept that I can really get into. It's definitely cool and interesting, but I do hope that Bloodshot himself has a weakness other than the fact that he's being tricked with implanted memories. If not, I just don't see where the tension comes from. In my opinion, tension is critical to making an action movie work. There are very few action movies that I find work where you don't have a sense that the protagonist could really cre could actually credibly lose. I read some articles online from Screen Rant that compared the concept compared the concept to Robocop. I will fully grant that Robocop is also very nearly unstoppable for a lot of his screen time. However, he isn't fully unstoppable. There are other entities that are entities that are as strong or stronger. A huge part of the appeal of at least the first movie and the miniseries is the satire. It's not just about exciting action and I mean this movie I'm sorry it does not really have anything else to really attract people other than the visuals and the act action and I get that the visuals don't need him to be vulnerable but for the tension in action scenes you do need some and let's see yeah so in the I was, yeah, so I was wondering if the character would end up feeling like a Wolverine ripoff, even if he isn't in the comics, since, you know, th this movie is getting made today after the Wolverine character was so popular. I wouldn't really say, it didn't make me think that much of Wolverine other than, you know, you, yeah, you've got the healing factor, but, and the lack of memories that lead to an identity and the, actually yeah they do have a number of similarities hmm actually yeah honestly it does feel he does feel a lot like Wolverine now they they trick him into thinking that his that he's avenging the yeah yeah it's actually I guess I'll, what I'll say is, until I reread that I had written that, I wasn't thinking about it. But yeah, there's a lot of Wolverine in 
his character in this movie. The yeah. Now let's see the skimming for stuff to get in. Holy crap, I copied in a lot of text. This is really, I, I literally just copied in a bunch of Screen Rant -ish articles about Bloodshot. Okay, here we go. I'm just, I'm not going to just sit and read those loud. Now, that brings me, yeah, so the editing of a bridged script. Hilarious, excellent, well written, tears apart tons of stupid mistakes in the movie. Yet another excellent script by Alex W. I'm just going to skim through it and possibly read aloud some of the funny lines. U.S. soldier Vin Diesel is rescuing hostages. He starts murdering bad guys by firing shots in random directions, which always happen to have bad guy have a bad guy at the other end. Vin defeats the final bat. He immediately trades in his combat gear for a tank top, hot babe, and fast car. And yep, this sure is a bold new direction for Vin. Maybe this version lives life a half kilometer at a time. You know, instead of like, I, th I think the Fast and Furious thing is quarter mile, so half a kilometer or quarter mile. And, yeah. Exterior, Amalfi Coast, Italy. Vin and his wife, Tallulah Riley, blissfully wander about the Italian coast, partaking of sunbeam gelato and unicorn lattes. Oh, and also super hot fuck sakes, sex, thanks to Vin's back-cracking high-cocktail high nitro junk. Okay, yes, this intro might seem way over the top, but that's a clue to the fact. These are all fake simulated memories, says Vin Diesel, and then Tallulah Riley points out, but this is how you introduce yourself in every movie. And then it says, Vin Diesel smiles, taps temples, so yeah, you know, that, ah, the, the meme. The next morning, Vin hopes for breakfast in bed, but instead gets goons in the bathroom. Luckily, there are only eight goons, so Vin is able to easily pulverize them using one finger each while flipping them off with the remaining two. Wow. And, you know, he gets knocked out and he wakes up into your slaughterhouse full of slabs of unexpressive beef. <laughs> Vin wakes up tied to a chair. Tallulah is also tied to a chair. They are confronted by Toby Kebbell, who is not tied to a chair. Quake before my evil flip-flops of doom. Tremble before my silly dancing. Now, let's see. And when Vin wakes up into a futuristic laboratory, Vin wakes up in a futuristic tank top. And line for Vin Diesel, where am I? I have absolutely no memories. In fact, I mentioned like we're out of Doritos. I did not expect Doritos to be as much of a running gag in this script as it is, but it, you know, absolutely love it. Let's see. And it points out how, you know, he really doesn't get any clues as to his real identity before he, the, the, Memories get triggered by the song. And let's see. And Guy Pierce takes him, you know, says, Please meet the rest of the Justice X Avenger Squad. You know, Justice League, X Men, Avengers, and Suicide Squad. And yeah, kind of. It's, it's, doesn't really feel like, you know, 
My cyber throat allows me to breathe and also swim with full makeup on. I had my powerful shapely legs blown off by an IED to the disappointment of all the Outlander fans who went to this movie. Guy Cybernetics gave me new legs but couldn't give me a proper American accent. Ah oh, well, it took Ewan McGregor a few moves to get right. Oh, bloody. In the movie, his Scottish accent isn't quite that pronounced, but, you know, it's a parody. It, it exaggerates things, and it is, yeah. I lost my eyes, so I have cameras stuck on every goddamn part of my body except my eyes, where it would make sense. So, yeah, welcome to the Valiant Cinematic Universe. Our current over-under is Dark Universe. And then it's, uh, you know, interior Stark Tower, and then it crosses out Stark and writes in Pierce instead. That night, Vin cannot sleep, perhaps because he still has no fucking clue who he is, or perhaps those Doritos still haven't turned up. Who's to say? Guy showed me how my nanobots can heal a cut in my palm. I bet that means I can punch the fuck out of this pillar. Oh yeah, fuck you, dumb pillar, which is probably a structural support for this room. Fuck you so hard. Vin spots Aisa doing her late night underwater dance training and flexes his way over. And when Vin gets triggered by the song, it says, Vin grabs some gear and a tank top and a truck and zooms out, all full of rage and haste. Vin's nanobots use Guy's computer network to pinpoint Toby Kebble's location. At the moment, Toby is being driven from the all-orange city into an all-blue tunnel. I need ideas how to murder this fucker. Nanobots, access Guy's Netflix accounts. Has Suspiria 1977 beamed into brain? All red lighting, perfect. Has Hardboil beamed into brain? Oh, flower, yes. But not merely a few bags, I must use all the flower. Excuse me. Vin smashes a giant transport truck full of flour into Toby's motorcade. This makes everything red. Oh, and also fills the air with highly flammable flour dust. We're not going to worry about that. Now I shall have my vengeance and maybe finally find those Doritos. And yeah, this is also a pretty good point. Vin walks towards the guards and let himself get shot to fuck because, hey, those nanobots handle the cut to the hand and punching a wall, so for sure they can handle a getting his entire face blown the fuck off, right? Massive internal wounds to all major organs. That's like one step above fixing a single clean cut surface, right? Well, it turns out Vin is correct and he murders everyone and he's fine. And, you know, Sam asks him how he's feeling and Vin says, Let's just say it's a good thing Guy took out all my pain receptors when he put in those nanobots. Yeah, really. Just because he heals doesn't mean he doesn't feel pain. one of many reasons why Wolverine is more interesting. And, you know, Sam explains the truth of the evil plan. And Vin Diesel's response is, God damn it, there were never any Doritos were there. And Sam actually responds, nope. <laughs> You see, in honor of, of Valiant's 1990s origins, we rummaged through crappy tropes of crappy 1990s comics until we found one we could try to build a whole fucking franchise around. So basically, you are Fridge Man. And he's unconscious if I. I just need to. And I said. Gonzalez says, I just need to say, as the resident girl, I'm having obligatory pangs of conscience. Okay. 
and yeah, the the you know the dick sized joke happens, and then the script you know it it writes you know everybody as having the following line and you know parentheses uproarious laughter. Film pauses as cast literally busts their guts laughing. Entire crew nearly asphyxiates from full body racking hilarity. Cast and crew rush to ER. Not today, not on my watch, etc. Film resumes. That is kind of a long time to spend on one brief, like, you know, they don't spend a lot of time on the dick joke in the movie. But it is worth pointing out, just, it's, it's really not that funny. And it's like, they could have come up with a funny joke later. Man, let's see. Guy's new target is former business partner Johannes Hauker Johannesson, whom he cut loose because of all the extra ink they had to use on business cards and stationery. Plus, anytime they needed new company softball jerseys, they would need to order extra sets of letters, and it kept it just kept adding up, you know. Plus, he already saw, and and then Guy Pierce adds. Plus, he already saw me doing my mad science shtick in The Innocents, so fuck him. Go get him, Vin. Avenge me having to order extra wide nameplates for our office doors. Uh, I mean, your dead wife. Johannes Hauke Johannesson, my god, I felt myself age just typing that. And he says, not so fast, I have a wacky tech assistant of my own, plus an EMP device. It's true, I am quite wacky indeed. Ho -ho. And Vin Diesel realizes that, but responds, yeah, but triggering the EMP will require using your full name above a line of dialogue. By the time the author finishes typing it out, I'll already have killed you. And he gets to write, you know, Johannes H-A-U-K, and then, yeah, that he's dead. And then Diesel's like, told you. And... <laughs> Sorry about that, I had to give... And yeah, Lamorne Morris wakes him up, saying, Sorry about that, I had to get you off Guy's network. And now I can tell you the truth. Yes, this is just like earlier when you wake up, woke up and some tech guy spouted exposition at you. But the difference is, I'm saying this now, so it must be true. So everything Guy said was a lie. Huh. But I'm still not sure you're trustworthy. What if I give you this burner phone and a new tank top and another vintage fast car? And for a while, you know, and Vin Diesel stares at him and then Lamar Morris asks, And these Doritos? Thank you. And this is pretty funny. This is, you know, Tallulah Riley plays the wife and you know, yeah, Vin shows up and she's like, wow, this sure is a surprise after five years of not seeing you. Pipe down, son. I can barely hear my estranged ex-husband. Go play with your sister or maybe, maybe go bother your father, who is my current husband, and take the five-year-old dog that we all chose together as a family unit that does not include Vin. And Vin Diesel goes, crap, who knows what's real anymore? Maybe I actually hate Doritos. And let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Vin gets attacked by motorcycle Alex Hernandez, who has put on a giant opaque helmet that displays overhead map images of Sam and Vin, but not apparently images of where he himself is going. And, and, you know, Alex Hernandez notes, I thought all my cameras beamed images directly into my head. Why do I need this Daft Punk helmet at all? And, you know, Alex, Vin, and Sam run, bike, and fight, and eventually Sam gets hit by a truck. But Alex stabs Vin with Wi-Fi hotspot and allows Guy to shut him down. In case you lost track, this is the third time a conflict has ended with someone just switching Vin off. The, you know, they have the, the scene where the, you know, the, the simulation world, 
And Guy Pierce says, I don't really have anything to say to you, Ben. It's just that time where the hero and Big Bad traditionally jaw at each other. And it's true. It's like, they really didn't know. It's just, it's, yeah. And Vin Diesel goes, you don't know me. Heck, I don't know me. The audience, the audience sure as fuck don't know me. I just shuffle about having shit done to me, waiting for the nanobots to kick in and save the day. I have all the agency and compelling character traits of Iron Man's briefcase. And Guy Pierce says, I sent Isa to go capture Lamorne, but he got away. So I'm going to reset you to think Lamorne killed Tallulah this time. Then the next target will be the result of the employee poll. Right now, Jared Leto and Gwyneth Paltrow are neck and neck. And, you know, Vin asks him, you know, wouldn't it be easier to use the nanobots yourself. And Guy Pierce responds, I guess that's just not my aim. Hehe, <laughs> I'm sorry. Guy fires up the simulation creation so creating software, but downstairs, Aisa sneaks into the insert yourself into the virtual memory simulation currently being created room. Because of course that exists, why wouldn't it? I defused Guy's remote control with a smoke grenade or some bullshit so I can fight by your side. Anywho, while you fight everyone yourself, I'm gonna go blow up the server room. Is there any chance my real memories are stored somewhere in the Woohoo! Computers go boom! Now yay! And Sam says. I've added two robo arms now, so I'm Dr. Dragonfly, maybe? And Alex Hernandez, the camera, you know, says, For the last time, Vin, stop staring at my chest. My eyes are, oh, right, they're on my chest. But there are also other places, Vin. They all leap into an exposed elevator shaft and fight and fall down, but Vin falls down better and heavier than them. So they die and Vin wins. And, you know, Vin admits nanobots are running low, but dodging is bullshit. The nanobots do one last elaborate VFX shot, piecing together a blown fuck Vin Diesel, since that is this movie's one and only signature move. After which various computer displays make it quite clear the nanobots are totally exhausted. Zero percent left, they are Dunsmill. Looks like Guy has the upper robot hand now. Hmm, I hope you don't have some clever trick up your lack of sleeve. I really love Alex W's abridged scripts. They are so good. Wow. And Vin wakes up in the RV and Lamar Morris is like, Welcome back. I am still wacky. <laughs> Thanks. So the reason I'm not dead as fuck is... And let's say we planted a shred of you in a pot. Now to drive off into the sunset of the Valiant Com Cinematic Universe. Don't you mean sunrise? <laughs> and then everybody wrenches their entire body apart laughing, literally rip themselves into pieces, collapse in bloody chunks, and the nanobots shrug and eat Doritos. It's very funny. And... Yeah, that brings us to the final section. IMDb and Wiki IMDb, Wikipedia and critic sites. So yeah, the 
when I last checked, which, come to think of it, was might have been like a few weeks ago, I forgot to check it again, but anyway, the critics' consensus was Bloodshot gives Vin Diesel a solid opportunity to indulge in old-school action that should satisfy fans even if the end result is disappointingly mediocre. And it has a 30, at the time, it had a 30% with, let's see, out of 159 ratings, 112 of them were rotten, so yeah. The audience score is 78%, wow. But IMDb, it has like 5.4 or something, which is, yeah, about right. I get getting into the movie and being excited about it, but giving it much more than a 5, I could maybe understand a 7, but above that I really don't think you're being, I think you're a little biased is all I'm going to say. I think you're, you're focusing entirely on the positives of the movie and not really focusing on the negatives. Or, you know, maybe you feel that the positives so greatly outweigh the negatives, but uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I'll just say that I disagree with you on that. Agree to disagree. Now, let's see. Okay, so I think this is Rotten Tomatoes critic review. The Hollywood pitch for Bloodshot must have been something like it's Iron Man meets Robocop by way of Wolverine, which actually kind of works as it combines some of the best aspects of these solo characters. And yeah, that's true. Everything feels in, about this feels stuck in the 90s and virtually never to its credit. The gyrations of the story are fun to follow, even if it's impossible to care. I wouldn't say impossible. I cared a little bit. Incoherent action sequences and strange sci-fi woo-woo can't save a clueless mashup of Robocop the Matrix and Captain America that makes a mockery of its protagonist. Deeply terrible. The result is nearly equal balance, equally balanced between bad and good, the kind of movie worth watching if you're curious or, say, if you're stuck at home for an extended period. The fast-paced, ever-changing storyline is the strength of this movie. See, that's the thing. Obviously, that, that person was referencing Corona. Even if I... I mean, uh, once again, I... I review most current comic book adaptations. And again, I'm not happy that I watched it. But if I didn't do that, I wouldn't... I probably wouldn't have watched this movie, you know, and... Yeah, if I wasn't doing this video, I don't think I would. Yeah, I, I wouldn't really care about whether or not I watched this. Like, yeah, you know, oh, you've got limited time, and yeah, but there are other, there, there's other stuff to watch. Now, let's see. it worked for the first third of it, but the rest of it, almost everything they have in here felt carved together from different movies. By the time it's done, you just saw something that was alright. It has this really good story, but they did nothing with it except become a typical action blockbuster. Excuse me. No expansion, and it's not that that solid or entertaining. They just don't follow through with their great ideas. It's too bad that Bloodshot doesn't seem up to the task of fully skewering its genre and finding something new in the process, instead relying on resurrecting the dead another bout of briefly diverting entertainment. Full of tired cliches, cardboard characters, and a lack of filmmaking panache, Bloodshot never delivers anything that makes it stand out from the crowd. An utter misfire of a movie, an attempt at franchise building that fails to even build a workable foundation. It's difficult to articulate just how completely everyone involved missed the target. Bloodshot should have bled out. In short, one more step for equality between man and machine, although not so much for gender equality. Give Vin Diesel credit for trying to break away from the Fast and Furious mold, but his in emotional convictions aren't good enough to set the weight, sell the weight of the picture. Wow, I have not gotten enough sleep tonight. Last night. There you go.
Blood Shot follows a standard formula where what matters is the execution. Good schlock is preferable to senseless score for tensions bowers. It's cliche to say that you get your money's worth, but this one delivers as it promises. First time feature director Dave Wilson has taken what is actually a fairly interesting premise and made it feel like a fairly generic video game. When the mummy ran Universal's Dark Universe plans right off the rails and people said, wow, we've never seen anything sideline franchise so quickly, well, here's Columbia Pictures with Bloodshot saying, hold my beer. The Bloodshot accidentally calls out the hollowness of every superhero movie by trying to beat them at their own game. It admits Vin Diesel is a tool to be deployed in, a very, in very specific circumstances, and it comes so close to self-awareness but drops the ball. The burly baritone voiced action star's latest bloodshot is a superhero rehash that epitomizes excuse me, the 52-year-old's uninspired risk-averse choices, features some stylish visual flourishes undercut by chaotic action sequences and an over-reliance on slow motion. I can't think of a film this audacious that it that is also so forgettable. Only Australia's Guy Pierce as one of the madder mad scientists in play here, and Isa Gonzalez echoing some of her good work in Baby Driver deliver anything to distract viewers from becoming hypnotized by Diesel's permanent grimace. Being able to actually see what's happening during the action scenes is my minimum requirement for goofy action movies. Why do filmmakers keep getting this so wrong? Wow, there are a lot of these. Okay. Um, maybe I'll start reading them faster. Pretty good sci-fi plot is mostly ruined by mindless action sequences, vacant characters, and a need to completely wring the life out of whatever cleverness the movie might once have had. Who is Bloodshot? What are the secrets of his past? Should we care? This seriously got a theatrical release and isn't a Netflix original? Bloodshot plums new depths by bringing to life a very strange, very specific kind of 90s superhero story. The film's execution leaves a little to be desired, but it's such a ridiculous and ambitious prospect that it's hard not to love it. Okay, I'm going to skip some of these. I recommend you read the critic reviews in general. So, wow, really marked a lot of these. It's interesting. I don't. I did not realize at the time that I would be this tired of. Yeah, I'm about ready to stop recording very soon. But there is a little bit more that I do want to get to. Okay. Okay, that took out a lot of them. Yeah, so IMDB, the, yeah, the two taglines, being a hero is in his blood. You don't need a past to have a future. I don't know, I found the following a little interesting. This is a, this is one of the goofs in the goose section, and yeah, it's factual error. Katie's character is said to use a mechanical enhancement on her chest to breathe, bypassing her throat. If this were to work, she would actually be unable to speak, since the vocal cords slash windpipe would still need a rush of air going through her throat. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah. I guess everything in this part on is going to be, yeah. 
Okay, so I think that does say everything. I think I've said everything that I really badly wanted to say. And yeah, just, you know, I mean, if you've somehow made it all the way this far into the video without watching it, I've already given a lot away, but yeah, just if you, I can imagine that it, people who love Vin Diesel are probably happy to see this kind of, but yeah. And I'm just really briefly going to show the cover. I try not to catch the light too much. I get yeah, get a glare. I guess catch the light, and not go so, something like that. Is that that might be the best? It's gonna get yeah. So that is pretty cool. Yeah. And I mean. If you like the movie, the Blu-ray does have some... I, I liked watching the special feature. I like watching the special features more than I like watching the movie, honestly. But yeah. And again, I'm not, I'm not unhappy that I watched it. It's... It was perfectly fine. You know, I... I've watched worse. And... Yeah. So... Without further ado, I hope you enjoyed watching, as I partially enjoyed watching, and I'll catch you next time.